Okay, Professor Williams has taught and is still teaching philosophy as well as U.S. government, history, and political science for 40 years at a two-year liberal arts college in California. The college is Glendale Community College. He's a lover, teacher, avid reader, and scholar of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. And he also adheres to the, and uses the Socratic method of teaching. So um, I welcome Professor Williams, and I hope this is a treat for everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if you all take a moment and look over the uh, handout, uh, I put that together uh, specifically with the idea that uh, it might trigger some questions uh, or things that you see there that you're shaking your head about, uh, would like more information on. So take a moment, look at it, and I'll be glad to answer any questions anybody has. Well, let me uh, begin uh, then by asking this question. Uh, uh, why should we read Aristotle's ethics uh, and why should we take seriously anything he says uh, in the work? I think the short answer to that uh, comes from Aristotle. Uh, uh, and Aristotle uh, presents you with in effect uh, what is in effect a conditional answer. Uh, takes the form of an if-then statement. And the statement is as follows. If you want to be happy, if you're serious about happiness, uh, if that's uh, uh, the aim that, uh, you, or the highest thing that you seek in life, then there are certain things that you must do, that you should do, while there are other things that you should not and must not do. One of the means, uh, or the things that you should and must do, to put it another way, are means to the end that is happiness. Happiness, Aristotle uh, observes, is the highest human good. That is to say, it is the good which, uh, uh, for the sake of which, everything else that is good, is good. Take, for example, uh, a cast on a broken leg, or a shot of penicillin to treat uh, a bacterial infection. Those things are good, not for their own sake. Uh, but for the sake of something else. Uh, uh, mending the broken leg, uh, treating the bacterial infection. There are many, many things uh, that are at the bottom of that pyramid or at the bottom of that hierarchy that are, again, things which are never good for their own sake but only for the sake of something else. Above the, uh, that lower level of the pyramid or the hierarchy are things which are good both for their own sake and for the sake of something else. In that category, we find the virtues. These things are good both for their own sake and for the sake of something else. Uh, they are good because they point beyond themselves to happiness. Happiness being the highest good or that thing which is good only for its own sake and never for the sake of anything higher or better that is beyond it. Aristotle then presents the ethics uh, uh, as a powerful uh, statement of conditional advice. If, again, happiness is what you aim at above all else, then there are certain things that you must do, certain things that you should do, other things that you should not, still other things that you must not do. Among those things uh, that uh, are on the list, or rather the to-do list, are the moral virtues. Now Aristotle in the Ethics presents uh, both the moral virtues and the dianoetic or the intellectual virtues. You'll notice on the list uh, five intellectual or dianoetic virtues. Now the word dianoetic comes from the noun noesis, N-O-E-S-I-S, and it means pertaining to or having to do with human knowing. Under the heading of the intellectual or dianoetic virtues, uh, you find uh, uh, art, science, intuition, philosophic wisdom, and what I have bold-faced there, practical wisdom. Why the bold face on practical wisdom? Because practical wisdom uh, is ever so much involved in the 11 moral virtues. Now, what is moral virtue? Moral virtue, uh, as I note here, uh, uh, is a state of character, concerned with choice, lying in a mean, the mean relative to us, 
that being determined by the rational principle and by that principle by which the man of practical wisdom would determine it. Let's take a close look. Or Does anybody have any questions or comments about this description of the genus moral virtue? If you do, uh, or any comments, please ask. And please feel free to speak up. Oh yeah, definitely. Notice, uh, in this description there are six separate elements. Uh, you might want to number each one of them for sake of future reference. First of all, moral virtue is a state of character. Moral virtue is not a sentiment, a feeling, compassion, empathy, sympathy, caring, what have you. It is a state of character. Question, how do we develop states of character? Aristotle, uh, in answering that question, begins by quoting an otherwise unknown ancient Greek author named Evenus, E-V-E-N-U-S. And approvingly, Aristotle quotes Evenus as saying that habit, quote, habit is but long practice, friend and habit is what becomes man's nature in the end. The moral virtues become, as it were, our acquired second nature. And how do we acquire them? By long practice. Habit, again, is but long practice, friend, Evenus said. And habit is what becomes man's nature in the end. How many of you have heard the old saying, practice makes perfect? Anybody heard that? Yeah. Now, that is not necessarily correct. What is correct uh, is to say that, happy, uh, that pr uh, habit rather makes permanent. That those things which we do over and over again, over a long period of time, become our acquired second nature. The, you know, and this is true both of the virtues and of the vices. Let me illustrate this uh, with the uh, sad uh, life of my late uncle. My late uncle was an alcoholic. And I don't mean an occasional drinker, a heavy social drinker. I mean a fifth or more of bourbon a day alcoholic. Uh, uh, how did he become an alcoholic? By getting drunk once every year? By getting drunk once in five years? How did he become an alcoholic? Anybody, how would you think you'd become an alcoholic? Pardon me? I said drinking all the time. Yeah, drinking what? Uh, uh, too little or too much? Too much. Yeah, too much. Drinking far too much over and over and over again, many, many times over a long period of time. At some point, uh, uh, you become, if you do that, you become what? an alcoholic. How do you know that a person has become an alcoholic? Is there a sign, an indication, uh, something that the person uh, uh, displays that tells us this person is an alcoholic? Or you could say the same thing about a drug addict, you know, a methadone addict or a meth amphetamine addict, a cocaine addict. Uh, how do you know? when that person has become an alcoholic or an addict? Is there some sign or indication that points to that alcoholism or the fact that that person is addicted? Anybody think of a sign? Go ahead. Uh, it seems to be, I guess, something that they just can't do without. When they have problems or issues, they, they go to, you know, drinking or whatever other habit they may have. They can't do without it to the point that uh, when they are forced to do without it, they are pained, aren't they? Not only physiologically, uh, in the case of trying to withdraw from addictive drugs, but also what? Psychologically, mentally, emotionally. My late uncle, the last 10, 12 years of his life uh, as an alcoholic, was a man who literally could not live without uh, the next drink. Deprive him of the next drink, uh, his life was miserable. 
Did he pay a heavy price for his alcoholism? Yeah, he paid a horrendous price. It cost him a good career. Ruined his marriage. Put him into an early grave. Cost him all of his friends. Who wants to be around? A drunk. Hmm? You know, at a Saturday night party, they might be amusing for a while, uh, but how many of you would like to live year after year with a drunk? Would anybody? Hmm? I don't think so. Uh, that is how you develop these states of character. This is true of the vices. It is true also of the virtues. To illustrate uh, how we become gluttonous. How do we do that? How do we become a glutton? Overeating? Yeah. By overeating once a year on Thanksgiving Day, which I call National Gluttons Day. I mean, we all indulge, uh, but uh, eating too much on Thanksgiving Day doesn't make you an alcoholic, or I'm sorry, a glutton. Uh, eating far too much food at the wrong time, in the wrong way, the wrong kinds of food, for the wrong reasons, in the wrong circumstances, and doing that over and over and over again makes you a glutton. Now I've illustrated two of the vices and something else I want to uh, talk about. You'll notice uh, uh, the third part of the description. Moral virtue is a state of character concerned with choice lying in a mean. The mean to which Aristotle refers is uh, a point that is somewhere between the two moral vices that are opposed to each moral virtue. One of those moral vices is the vice of excess, the vice of too much. The other moral uh, vice is the vice of deficiency the vice of too little. Let's take uh, the vice of gluttony. The glutton is again a man who eats the wrong kinds of food, too much food, too often, for the wrong reasons, in the wrong way, in the wrong circumstances, and always goes wrong by going to the extreme of what? Too little or too much? Too much the extreme of excess. Does anybody have any idea what the extreme of deficiency, of too little is? Yeah, the person who uh, uh, habitually does not eat enough food, enough of the right kinds of food, uh, often enough, uh, in the right way. What do we call those people? We have a name for them. Hmm? Anybody? Anemic. Anemic has to do with uh, insufficient uh, uh, red blood cells, but you're close. Uh, it's anorexia. Yeah, thank you. The an anorexia is a vice. It's the vice of too little. And it, uh, along with gluttony, the vice of too much, are the two vices opposed to moderation. You'll notice the second of the moral virtues uh, uh, that I list here is moderation or temperance. The moderate man uh, eats the right kind of food at the right time, in the right way, in the right circumstances, for the right reasons, and never goes wrong by going to the extreme either of too much or of too little.